As she said, I'm Dr. Cheryl Barnes. I'm a board certified dermatologist at McIntosh Clinic. And tonight I thought this was gonna be a great subject to talk about since we're about to start the summer season with Memorial Day and many of you may be going to the beach. Um, this is National Skin Cancer Melanoma Month, if you're not aware of that. So it's important that we educate all of you in reference to um, skin cancer and the effects that the sun can do on your skin. Now, as everyone knows, there's about a million skin cancers diagnosed each year, and that seems a lot. It's, um, that's a lot of cancer, and one in five of you in this room will have a skin cancer sometime in your life. And that's, that's kind of a lot of people, and, and some may have multiple skin cancers. Half of all new cancers in the U.S. are skin cancers that are diagnosed. Fortunately, most of them are treatable with simple excisions or certain creams or procedures. Why are we fussing about skin cancer if most of them are treatable? Well, there is a deadly kind of skin cancer that um, is the, whose incidence is increasing in the United States at an alarming rate. And why this is, we think it's the effects of the sun and people tanning and not realizing, some are not educated that the sun can do damage to your skin. Back in the 1930s, it was estimated that 1 in 1,500 people get melanoma. Now it's about 1 in 50, and that's, that's scary. That's a lot more people expected to get melanoma sometime in their life. We do know that sun exposure and tanning is directly linked to skin cancer. We didn't know that back early on, so tanning and um, sun exposure is not good. Now when we talk about um, sun and sunscreens, it's important we do a little bit of background information to educate you on. Um, there are two rays that we need to um, be concerned about that can, um, can be affected and the skin can be infected by. One is UVB. Years ago we thought this was the only ray that was doing damage to our skin and this is the uh, 290 to 320 nanometer wavelength that predominantly causes all your sunburn. So every time you get a sunburn you know you've had UVB and this used to be the only thing we thought did damage to the skin. We now think that UVA may actually be the more dangerous ray that causes damage. This ray actually penetrates the skin deeper and causes um, some immunosuppressive effects on the skin. It also can cause a lot of DNA mutations and we think that this ray could actually be doing more damage. So you don't want the sun to ruin your skin. And as you can see from the diagram here, UVB penetrates the, uh, through the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, whereas your UVA penetrates much deeper down to almost your subcutaneous fat, causing more DNA mutations and suppressing the skin. So we're gonna get cut right to the chase. I wanna start by saying if any of you have lesions that look like this on your skin, you need to be worried about them, okay? This is, of course, the deadly skin cancer that everybody has probably heard about in this room. This is your melanoma. And melanoma can affect any race. Um, it can affect any place on the body, including the trunk, the face, and the nail beds, and hands and feet. So it, it spares no area of the body. What is melanoma? It's the skin cancer that originates from the pigment cells of the skin, the melanocytes. And 50% of melanomas occur from pre-existing lesions you may have. Some of you may have birthmarks or dark lesions uh, that you've had many years and all of a sudden they start to change. They may start to itch or they may start to get multicolored. This is an alarming change that you need to seek a doctor for. 50% of melanomas actually occur, what they say, on normal skin. You've never had the dark spot there in your life. All of a sudden, you see a new dark spot on your skin. So keep in mind that some are from pre-existing lesions and some are not. The peak age that this is diagnosed is around 50. So I always recommend to patients and people that they should have skin screen around 50 every year. And those who have had a melanoma need more frequent skin screening. Melanoma can occur in puberty, okay? Puberty and onward is, the, is where the risks occur. It's less than 1% under puberty, but again, this is the number one, skin, or number one cancer diagnosed in the age group of 25 to 29. So again, these people are not without risk, and they need to be screened as well if they're a high-risk patient. 
Fortunately, melanoma is only 4% of the skin cancers diagnosed in the United States, but it's 80% of all deaths attributed to skin cancer, okay? So this is the deadly one that everybody has heard about. Um, it's also alarming. Georgia seems to have a higher rate than the national average, about 13% higher, and probably that's due to all of our um, sun exposure and beach trips uh, down to Florida or those that have uh, spent a lot of time out in the sun. What's alarming is the incidence. As I've already discussed, in the 30s, it was 1 to 1,500. It's now 1 to 50. And it's the fifth most common cancer diagnosed in men, the seventh in women. And it represents about 100,000 new cases per year diagnosed. And it kills about 10,000 people per year. So again, this is alarming, and we want to prevent this. And the best way to do the, prevent death is early detection and, um, and uh, primary uh, avoidance, and that is being careful in the sun. As I've already discussed, the incidence is increasing and will continue to do so without educating the United States that sun and sun exposure is dangerous. And we already discussed that it's uncommon in children or adolescents. It's less than 1% in puberty. But 80% of us in this room have done most of our um, damage by age 20, unless you're an outdoor worker or a farmer and you continue to tan. So environmental risks seem to be done when we are children. And so that's why we need to educate children not to get in the sun, not to tan, not to get in these tanning beds, because this is where a lot of the damage is done early. And then once we get older, we can't turn back the hands of time. Who gets melanoma? What are the risk factors? Okay, It's common in, it tends to run in families. Okay, there are, are, is a, There's a P16 gene that they've been able to isolate in some family members that uh, have uh, multiple melanomas and multiple family members with melanoma. It occurs more commonly in people that have more dark spots. The more you tan, the more moles. The more moles, the increased risk for melanoma particularly if patients have atypical moles, meaning they look not quite round regular under the microscope or clinically. They have a little fuzzy borders, they have multicolors, they may look like a fried egg, um, they just don't look quite normal. Patients who are immunosuppressed with HIV or have a, a organ transplant and are on immunosuppressive meds, these people are at higher risk. Also patients who have had a previous malignancy have been on chemotherapy um, those, those people are at higher risk for skin cancer. Minor factors that put you at risk are your redhead, light-skinned, blonde hair, blue-eyed, those people, your classic Australian, British, Irish, Scandinavian descents. Um, patients who have had blistering sunburns. Anybody that's had a blistering sunburn puts you double risk for melanoma sometime in your lifetime. Again, frequent sun exposure without sunscreen. This puts you at risk. And these are your classic people that I get a little more nervous about in clinic when I see them. A red, freckly, inability to tan without burning, and frequent sun exposure. Patients also at risk are these with multiple moles. As I said, more sun equals more moles. More moles equals your risk for melanoma. There are a lot of patients with what we call dysplastic nevus syndrome who have these atypical, funny-looking, um, appearing moles that aren't quite round, regular, one color. And again, subtle changes can occur in these and you don't detect them because there's so many to look at. These patients need mole mapping and frequent screening and multiple skin biopsies and constant surveillance to prevent melanoma. When I do a skin exam, I'm not just looking at one lesion. I, don't, I tend to like to, when I see a patient, some people refuse to undress and let me see their whole skin. However, I like to kind of look through all the moles because a lot of times it's not a classic textbook lesion that you see. It's a, what we call the ugly duckling sign. It's a lesion that may be round and regular, but it's darker than the other moles that you have. It kind of stands out. It may look kind of like fried egg and all your other moles are like round and black. So you don't just look sometimes at one lesion. It's kind of important that your doctor sort of kind of do a panoramic view of all of them and what stands out sometimes gets your attention and makes me want to biopsy um, those lesions. So again, we've already discussed more sun exposure equals more moles, more moles equals more risk for melanoma, and the more sunburns you have equals and doubles your risk for melanoma. 
what do we look for? How do I educate you to do self-skin exams? I'm going to pass out these um, pamphlets, and these are free for you guys to take. And these are what we call the ABCDs of melanoma. This came out actually when I was a senior in high school. And um, we, until then, we never really educated patients. In the 80s, we started to get smart and uh, came up with a little strategic educational tool to try to educate pa uh, patients about melanoma. A stands for asymmetry. Of course, the lesions on the left are what we want to see. Hold on. These are nice, round, regular borders, one color and small. These are what obviously we don't want to see, okay? So again, A stands for asymmetry. If you fold the lesion on itself, is it, is it symmetric, okay? Borders. We want round borders. We don't want jig-jag borders. We don't want, um, again, multicolors, which is what the C stands for. We want one color in our moles. And then diameter. Usually they say bigger than a pencil head eraser can be more alarming. I have gotten melanomas that are two millimeters, very small. So again, I tend not to go with size. It's more with the look of the lesion. They've recently added the E to the ABCDs, and that's evolving. Anything that itches, bleeds, um, just looks different to you is alarming and should be alarming and get you to see your dermatologist or physician right away. So when you have a lesion like this on your skin, do you worry? Well, if you are worried, you need to seek your doctor right away because the earlier you get these lesions, this may save your life as we don't have any cure for this skin cancer right now except for simple excision. There are no chemo agents or biologics that cure melanoma. And again, we are coming up, there's many, many new drugs on the horizon, which we are happy about. We haven't had any in years, and they're starting to get smart with this cancer. This cancer can mutate, so you start them on one agent, and then the cancer gets smart, mutates, and then we add another agent. And we're finding out what this cancer is doing, and we're getting new drugs trying to solve the mystery of melanoma. But to, to this date, cutting them out and hoping we get this early is your best bet for a survival. Now, the more common skin cancers are what I spend the majority of my time in clinic diagnosing. And the, and the squamous cell carcinoma and the basal cell carcinoma are what we call non-melanoma skin cancers. And these make up 95% of all the skin cancers diagnosed. And these directly correlate with sun exposure. The more sun, the more likely of these types of skin cancers. Fortunately, most of these are curable. The first one I want to discuss about is the most common. This represents about 85% of skin cancers diagnosed. This is the least aggressive skin cancer that is diagnosed in the United States. Classically, when I learned in school, we talked about the brown, pearly, bordered lesion that starts to bleed. They can look like red rashes that just persist and stay there. Or they can be a very disfiguring cosmetically and start to scar down the eye, as this lesion is about three times the size under the skin than it is on the skin. These are alarming um, so, uh, skin cancers, yet they're not usually deadly skin cancers. These can be cosmetically disfiguring, but not as aggressive, and they don't usually metastasize or go to other places of the body. Um, they're very slow growing, um, and again, they need to be cut out. Um, usually that's all that takes to cure these type of skin cancers, and these are more common, again, in your fair skin, patients with sunburns or frequent tanners. Your other skin cancer that this is um, also a killer, and most people don't think about the squamous cell skin cancer as um, as a, a deadly skin cancer, and it can be. These can be invasive, and they can go down nerves and get into the lymph nodes quickly, especially on the head and neck if you leave them. Um, these need to be cut out in completion, and these represent about 15% of all skin cancers. Men tend to get these more than women. Um, again, the fair skin tanners, the organ transplant recipients, and HIV, HIV patients are more at risk. More aggressive than the basal cell, these are derived from the keratinocyte type cell in the skin, and again, these are directly correlated with sun exposure. A lot of times, 
these begin as with pre-cancers. Many of you that I see in this room have seen a dermatologist in my clinic or me, as I see some familiar faces, and you may come in complaining of a mild, scaly, kind of um, sensitive plaque that we typically pull out our freeze gun and freeze. But many of these can progress to squamous cells, and that's what we try to avoid. That's why we treat these precancers with our freeze gun. We want to prevent these nodular um, skin cancers that can develop very quickly on the skin. This is another example of precancers on the hands that quickly develop to be squamous cell skin cancers. Again, these can go places. You do not want to leave squamous cell skin cancers on the skin. Many of you also get a lot of um, sun damage on the lips, and this can progress to a head and neck squamous cell as well. So keep in mind, you need to protect your lips, not just your skin, with sunscreen. I wanted to bring this up as I've had several questions lately in my clinic about tattoos. Tattoos is the latest craze. I can't begin to tell you. Even patients in their 50s are getting tattoos. And there's been some question as is do the, these skin dyes or these dyes in these tattoos cause skin cancer? And to date, there have been no studies to show these patients get skin cancer in these um, inks. Okay, I don't care what color you get, or what size you get of, of these tattoos. That there's been no studies to suggest tattoos cause skin cancer. However, let me caution you: if you decide to get that tattoo all of a sudden. Be careful where you place it. I try to tell my patients, I'm not against tattoos. I don't, I don't tell people my opinion on them. But you want to leave any moles or any dark spots that you may have on your skin visible. Because I have taken off several skin cancers, including melanoma, in tattoos. It's much harder to identify the skin cancer if you can't see it. If you got a tattoo all over your body like this patient, it's very difficult for me to say, oh, I'm not sure because I really can't see the lesion. And it makes it very difficult to do skin exams. A lot of these people are getting these full sleeve and full body tattoos, and that puts you at a little bit at risk. I will say that tattoo ink can cause some allergic skin reactions and particularly some photo eruptions. Red, your reds, greens, and your yellow inks can be a little bit uh, more troublesome in patients. And also these are risks for infection. You wanna go to a clean tattoo parlor. You also wanna be careful because hepatitis can be spread through blood and these can, um, these, the procedure to put these on can draw blood. They also can cause local infections like staph infections when you get these lesions if you don't care for their wounds. All right, prevention. That's what you all are probably here for. You want to know how to prevent a skin cancer, okay? Um, the old approach, of course, when we were growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s to age myself was just detect these early. Okay, you know, you know what to look for. You've been educated in the ABCDs. Okay, you see something unusual in your skin and you get to see your doctor. Now the new approach is let's prevent these altogether. And how do we do that? And that's what the United States has been behind on compared to other nations. We are the worst country for uh, educating in sunscreen use right now based on some use surveys that I'm going to present. Australia is way ahead of us. Of course, their population is at higher risk being near the equator, and they all are fair. Most of the Australians are fair. However, we have a lot of fair individuals looking in this room, and we don't do a very good job educating our children or even our adults on how to prevent these things. Sun safety tips. Everything's at the ABCDs, okay? A stands for avoid. Avoid sun altogether. Of course, I used, to, I used to tan when I was in high school. I didn't know I was going to be a dermatologist. And I hate to say it, I did the baby oil and iodine. Probably all of you that were brought up probably in the 50s, 60s, 70s said, oh, tan, you look better. It's brown fat looks better than white fat. I know you all have heard that, okay? But that is crazy, okay? So basically, I cook myself with baby oil and iodine, as many of you probably did as you're laughing, because I hear some of you as smiling at me as I say that, okay? But let's avoid the sun. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. are when the, the rays are the strongest. They beat right down on us, okay? Try to stay out of direct sunlight during that time frame. B stands for block, and I'm going to talk a lot about sun uh, screens and which kind to buy, as probably you have a lot of questions on that. You want a sunscreen of at least an SPF of 30, and I'm going to talk about what SPF is. 
and you want to apply it 20 minutes before going out in the sun, and you want to reapply, here's the problem, reapply every two hours. It's not, it's not licensed for you to apply and stay out 10 hours. It does not give you a license to tan, okay? That's where a lot of people, they say, oh, I put sunscreen on, doctor. I'm like, yeah, how many times did you do it? And did you swim and sweat? Because if you swim or sweat, you need to reapply right after you come out, okay? It washes away, okay? C is cover up. You want a three inch wide brim hat, no baseball cap, people that don't work, okay? That doesn't protect you from your ears and all the other areas of your neck, okay? You want a wide brim, about a three inch hat is what they recommend. You want tightly woven clothing and sunglasses. Remember your eyes, okay? And then you want S, shade. Especially babies, keep them out of direct sunlight. You need to stay out of the direct sunlight, stay in the shade, and use umbrellas. All right, so how many sunscreens? What sunscreen to buy, okay? I brought a lot of samples of sunscreen. She's going to pass around a few of these bottles. These aren't samples. I want them back, okay? okay. These, <laughs> these tell you what I want on the bottles, okay? This is what is important. Okay, there's been a lot of controversy with sunscreens now. All right, first of all, I'm going to talk about the SPF factor, okay? This stands for sun protective factor. The sun protective factor only protects UVB, okay? Hear me out, UVB. When I was young, we only had SPF of 4 and 8. We had that Hawaiian Tropic coconut stuff. We had a few little, oh, it smells good. Okay, those were SPF. They weren't broad spectrum. Okay, it doesn't mention the UVA, okay? Now, what did I say at the beginning of the talk? We think UVA is the ray that's causing more damage. We didn't know that back then. An SPF of 15 applied properly represents or prevents 94% of UVB reaching the skin, okay? So the American Academy used to say SPF of 15 was enough, but guess what? Not everybody applied enough sunscreen, okay? How much do you apply? What is the proper amount that you should use, okay? I brought my handy dandy shot glass, okay? This is what they recommend, this amount with each application. Of course, it's my Auburn Tigers to so go Auburn. Sorry, I had to put that in there. But this is the shot glass size. This is what you need to apply this amount. Some people say two tablespoons. So if you're not applying that much to cover your body, you're not applying enough, okay? Again, these do not protect the UVA, okay? UVA has nothing to do with SPF. We're going to get into that. The American Academy of Dermatology then changed its recommendations a couple years ago because people were not applying a shot glass full of sunscreen to their body. So now the recommendation is SPF of 30. A 30 is not twice as effective as a 15, okay? So a 94% UVB for 15, a not, um, sorry, a 94% for 15, a 97% for a SPF of 30, okay? So it's not twice as effective. You're still doing okay with 15, better than nothing, okay? There is no way to block with sunscreen 100% of the sun's rays, okay? If you get an SPF of 90, you got about a 99% protection. It's not 100%, okay? Really, you're wasting your money probably after 30 to, you know, 40. It doesn't matter, okay? You got me? It's 1% more, all right? So what, I'm, what I want you to get when you're getting sunscreen is what I'm passing these bottles around. It should say a broad spectrum. Okay, and what that means is you, you have a physical blocker in there, and that's going to help you protect against the UVA rays that penetrate. That reflects energy, okay, the physical blocker, and they should have like a zinc oxide in it or a titanium dioxide in it, okay. Chemical blockers absorb still and scatter, and that was the old agents, the PABA that remember y'all had in the... Uh, the 80s with their sunscreen, it had a lot of PABA, and a lot of people had reactions to PABA. I don't know if y'all remember that. Um, however, we have much better sunscreens. They came out in the 90s, so everyone should be getting a total broad spectrum UVA, UVB of an SPF of 30 or higher, okay? Hopefully that will clarify some of your sunscreen purchases, okay? Now, they make special ones for the face that say non-comedogenic. Those women, they, you need to put it under your makeup. A lot of the makeup bases do not have enough protection. They will have some, but most of them are not 30, okay? 
All your brand name makeups, Clinique, L'Oreal, a lot of them are 15, some of them are eight. They vary per brand and per uh, type of base or powder that you use. But I always recommend an extra coat. Men, it's all year round, just like makeup. Like women, you know, are better about putting stuff on their face than men. It's not just in the um, summertime. It's wintertime, fall, spring, all year round. Get your ears. Don't forget your ears, okay? Men say, oh, I don't want to put creams on. I hear it all the time. That's girlish. Again, you guys need to put sunscreen on too, okay? Women are much better about that because of the makeup. We have that double protection, okay? We're, we kind of are lucky that way, aren't we? All right? All right, we know sunscreen works when used. This was a study done with uh, first through fourth graders in Canada. Uh, 458 first through fourth graders were um, given sunscreen and were followed over three years. We know that the people that use the sunscreen develop fewer moles. And what did I already say? Fewer moles equals a lesser risk of melanoma. They develop about 35% fewer moles with good sunscreen use. So it works. We know it works if it's used properly. So if you tan and sunburn, okay, you're going to pay later with photo aging and wrinkles. And once you get this, it's very difficult to reverse. And I can look in, in here and say, and I can look at myself, okay? You hit the big 4-0, there's no reprieve. You see the damage you've done, there's, not, there's no hiding it, okay? It's difficult to correct. You can do laser resurfacing. You can do dermabrasions. You can do many things, facelifts even. It's just difficult to basically change the hands of time that you've already done. Again, this shows what sunscreen prevents, photo aging, dark spots blotchiness, okay? You dark skinned individuals in here, they always, I sit here and I, I preach till I'm blue in the face, okay? Yes, you have dark skin. You have better skin than us white people, okay? Having said that, you still can burn, you still can get skin cancer. Remember, a lot of your diuretics, a lot of your blood pressure medicines, it, those of you who are on Lasix and hydrochlorothiazide in here, you can burn on those drugs. They're very photosensitizing, okay? You guys can get melanoma. Guess where you get melanoma? Hands and feet, number one place, okay? I wanna mention that. So even though you have dark skin, and yes, it's better skin than me, you still can burn, you still can get skin cancer, but the biggest thing is you get blotchy. You get multicolored skin, facial skin, okay? So you wanna keep that even Beyonce complexion, right? Everybody wants Beyonce's complexion, smooth skin, no blotchiness. That's why you need sunscreen, okay? So remember that. I'll sit there and everybody looks at me funny when I say you need sunscreen. Everyone needs sunscreen, okay? It is not a license to tan, as I already said. You have to reapply, okay? A lot of people, this is the mistake they make. Oh, I put sunscreen on, doctor, and I still got tan. Okay, well, you've done damage, okay? So, yeah, you put sunscreen, I'll give you kudos for that, but you didn't apply it correctly, okay? And again, so is this primary prevention and education working in the United States? Again, despite us educating everybody and knowing that tanning and sun and tanning beds are bad, 26% 20, of parents still say a tan child looks better, looks more healthy, okay? And I remember my mother, I would go to the prom, and she goes, you need to go get a tan before you go to wear that prom dress. You'll look better. I remember her saying that. I remember laying out in the sun the day before the prom, okay? So, you know, I remember my mother saying that, yet, you know, why? I burned, you know? And now we know that was dangerous, okay? Despite knowing all the sun education in the United States and people knowing this through magazines and articles, 42% right now are applying sunscreen to the child, and they're doing much better about applying their children's sunscreen than they are applying it to themselves, okay? Still, 13% of children have sunburns in this study, okay? And as I already said, the U.S. is way behind the other countries in use of sunscreen and education and youth behavior. 13% right now from this youth survey done show that the U.S. is way behind. Australia has the best educational tools, uh, use in clothing, their schools get involved, they have programs with their schools to get these children to, to be aware that if they fry now, they're going to pay later. Okay? Again, the burn is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of DNA mutations and changes going on, okay, with a sunburn. Okay, commonly excuses I hear when I get a sunburn, but I use sunscreen, Doc. Okay? I get that all the time. Okay, yeah, you did. You use sunscreen. Okay, 
A lot of things, again, the SPF is too low. The recommendation says 30 now, shot glass amount, okay? They didn't apply it evenly. They forgot a spot. That happens. That has happened to me many times, okay? Again, trying to avoid that 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. direct sun exposure, okay? They were out all day. They didn't reapply every two hours. They, were, you know, they sweated or they swam and didn't reapply. And let me mention the water-resistant sunscreen. I didn't mention that. There's water-resistant, which recommend, the recommended time is about 40 minutes protection, okay, with water-resistant sunscreen. There's like extra water-resistant, they say up to 80 minutes in protection. So again, you, even with the water-resistant con, you need to reapply even more often too, okay? Sunburn, if you get one, okay, it's amazing what I pulled up last night on the internet, concoctions people apply on their skin with sunburns. And I was anywhere from mint, green leaf tea concoction to potato paste to baking soda to Anyway, this is the American Academy of Dermatology's recommendation for sunburn treatment. Cool compresses several times a day for 10 to 15 minutes. Do not use ice, okay? Cool compresses, cool rags. Moisturizers with aloe vera or soy. I do not like lidocaine, benzocaine. Neosporin is a no-no. Benadryl cream is a no-no. Remember, your skin is damaged when you're sunburned. You don't want to throw things on your skin that can act as an irritant or as an allergic problem. All that stuff I mentioned is a problem, okay? We see it all the time, okay? The layman doesn't realize that dermatologists hate Neosporin. Anybody that uses that, throw that out, okay? No dermatologist recommends Neosporin. 30% of people develop a contact dermatology reaction to Neosporin sometime in their life. We like polysporin or keep it simple. They don't really recommend petrolatum products because it holds in the heat. So you don't really want Vaseline jelly when you're sunburned, okay? Stuff with aloe that lets your skin breathe, okay? Or soy or more soothing and anti-inflammatory agents in moisturizers for sunburns. You want to leave blisters, if you get a blister intact, don't be taking a, like carving a knife or popping it or spreading the blister. You can do more damage, okay? Drink plenty of fluids. Remember, your skin is, the, is what keeps water in and water out. It keeps your balance, okay? Your skin is the largest organ in the body and keeps that balance, the temperature balance, your fluid balance, okay? You lose a lot more water when your skin is damaged, okay? When it's red, you're losing a lot more in, what they call insensible water loss when you're burned, okay? So drink more water, hydrate, okay? Ibuprofen, you want your NSAIDs, okay? Some of you may not be able to take them if you're on Coumadin or what your doctor recommends. These are your anti-inflammatory agents. They're the best, not Tylenol. Again, you gotta ask your doctor if you can take them. If, for those of you who are on these blood thinners and stuff, you may not be able to, again, take them with food, but they're the best for pain and discomfort. You wanna obviously protect your skin. I don't like all these concoctions that people put on their skin when it's damaged. You're at increased risk for causing problems. Skin cancer are you know, later problems, but earlier problems are infections and other issues when you're putting that stuff on your skin and you don't know what you're doing, okay? And if you're very sick, some people get fever, chills, and very sick with sunburns, you need to seek a doctor. You can get very dehydrated, very sick, and you may even need to seek um, and have medicine for that, okay? So don't take a sunburn, especially if it's a second degree full body, you need to be careful. You can get in trouble with that. Again, we kind of talked mainly about the sunscreen application tips, you know, reapply a shot glass amount or two tablespoons, spread thin, reapply. If you're in the water, reapply. I've kind of gone through that. Okay, this is a hot topic. Okay, tannin beds. For any of you that are doing tannin beds, no, 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 no. They are not safe. Okay, when they came out in the 70s, everyone thought they were safer than the sun. Um, there was a lot of um, false advertising. There was a lot of false information given to people, okay? Um, we know now from studies in, in the July of 2009, the World Health Organization added these apparatuses as the most dangerous cancer-causing radiation you can do. And some of these tannin beds have 12 times the amount of light admitted to the skin than the natural sunlight does, okay? I'm seeing more and more skin cancers and more early aged people with deadly skin cancers with use of tannin beds, okay? If we now know if used before age 30, 
The lifetime risk of melanoma is about 75% chance. Okay, we know that now. We did not know that back when, if any of you were doing them in the 80s, we didn't know it. We now know it. It also increases your risk for squamous cell by two and a half times and basal cells by one and a half times. 35% of females in this country are doing them at some point. I get a lot of, oh, I'm getting my base tan so I don't go burn at the beach or it's the prom or it's amazing to me how many people are at all ages are doing it, mainly young females. 5% of males are using them as well in the U.S. It's a $5 billion business in this country, and over 1 million are using them a day, okay? Women between the ages of 18 to 29 are the highest users, and there are people that are actually get addicted to tanning. You've heard of it. You've probably have seen it. They call it tanorexia. Okay? They can't stop tanning. Tanning helps induce endorphins. A lot of people say they get seasonal affective disorder if they don't get in the sun. The sun helps. Tanning beds do the same thing to people. They get addicted to it. They like the way they look. Again, brown fat looks better than white fat. I've had two patients recently tell me they will not dye white. They will not be, they're going to be brown in their coffin. I mean, that's what they tell me, and I laugh. <laughs> And um, a lot of times, until they get the melanoma, a lot of times I can get them to stop, but I just kind of shake my head. I kind of laugh. What am I going to say to them? Okay, that's fine. We'll take a picture of you so you can see it in heaven, you know, that you're brown, okay? But there is people that get addicted to tanning, okay? That is, it's like anything else. You know, they go through the 12-step program. And again, it does something to patients. It makes them feel good. And it's kind of similar to overeating and people that, you know, drink excessive alcohol. This is a scary statistic, and I put this in because I found this interesting. Um, you know, most campuses, college campuses, we send our kids off thinking they're safe and, and um, wanting them to be in the safe environments. They're smoke-free now. We realize smoking can cause lung cancer. But what about tanning? Half of all college campuses offer tanning services on their campuses or around their campuses. This was scary. And 14% of college campuses in the U.S. actually allow you to use those little food debit cards that your, your mom puts money in, you know, I had them when I was in college, let them tan with those cards. I was shocked by that per percentage. 12% 12 12 of colleges have tanning beds on campus and 42 offer them off campus, okay? We're sending our, our kids to college thinking they're safe and these colleges are promoting some cancer type behavior, okay? They have smoke-free campuses now. Why aren't they having tanning-free campuses? This needs to be addressed because this is the highest user rate is this age group, okay? And they're promoting uh, bad um, habits here, okay? Fortunately, legislation for each state is stepping in. Georgia has followed. Texas, 2009, they stated that they banned children under 16 from using them without parental consent, and a lot of other states are passing these laws. Um, and again, this is important. We need to legislate some of this because this is deadly behavior. All right, the other couple topics I wanted to address was this tan in a can, okay? Everybody has heard about the fake tans, either the lotion or the spray or the uh, mystic tans or the, where you go in and they spray paint you, okay? Are they safe? All right, the, the active ingredient in these sunless tanners is dihydroxyacetone, or DHA. This actually came out in 1973 when I was doing research for this talk. I didn't realize it had been out as long. The FDA approved it as, um, as early as the 70s, okay? It was approved in a lotion or a cream form, okay, when it came out. And what it does is it reacts with the basic amino acids in the top layers of your skin and it forms these brown color complexes in the skin called melanoids. And it does not offer any UV protection, so you need to put sunscreen over your fake tan, okay? That it does not have any um, protection against, not, you know, when you're at the beach with these fake tans, you need to put sunscreen over them, okay? You need to exfoliate before you use them, and they last about five days, okay? Again, they're available in all kind of formulations. Years ago, they made you kind of smell funny and that you kind of looked orange when you put them on, okay? They've improved them tremendously over the years. Now they're available in wipes and lotions and creams. You can get it spray painted with this stuff, and um, you can have booths, people spray you, all kinds of uh, apparatuses. However, a couple years ago, the question was raised that are these sprays safe with this chemical, okay? 
Again, the FDA approved these in the 70s in lotion and cream form, not sprays, and no one thought that this would happen, okay? The sprays. You inhale spray, okay? Spray gets in your eyes, in your mouth, in your nose, okay? So some studies show that they thought in high concentrations that this stuff actually can cause DNA mutations and some genotoxicity. A lung doctor out of the UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, brought this to everybody's attention. Studies are being done on this stuff now, okay? So bottom line is when you go into these places, and I've had many spray tans. I still think it's safer than the sun. Um, they will say it's completely safe, okay? We now know that studies are being done on this, okay? Um, always, and, I, and I, I stress this, and this is what I would recommend if you do these. Again, I think they are safer at this current time than the natural sunlight. But I would not, I do not get my face spray. That's the first thing. I mean, this is preferential how I do it. I keep my face protected. I close my eyes. I mean, I wear contacts, so I don't want the stuff in my eyes. I keep my mouth shut. I don't inhale it. I try, you know, I try. There's some that are boosts where you're shut in. There's some that, like, uh, the one I go to has a tent, and so there's open aeration. Be careful with um, inhaling that stuff right now, okay? We don't, the studies aren't out totally on the effects of the sprays. I just bring this to your attention again. To protect the eyes, your nose, your mouth, your mucosal membranes. You may want to be careful about doing your face, okay? They look natural. Again, I still think they're safer than natural sunlight, but be careful with these things, okay? Another topic that's hot is vitamin D. Okay, when the tannin beds came out, this was their argument. Well, you need your vitamin D, okay? This is what they were saying. The tannin beds are the great source of vitamin D. Remember, there are three main sources of vitamin D. Your diet, which is fish, dairy products, cereals, supplementation, and your UVB exposure. Okay, you need vitamin D. Vitamin D, this is the latest craze that many of your primary care doctors and doctors that you go to say, we need to check your vitamin D level. Okay, that's like the the lab de jour. That's the, you know, the name brand genes test of the day, Okay. Okay, you need vitamin D. It's very important for bone health and immunity. Okay, they're finding more benefits of vitamin D, but remember, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so you can get toxic on vitamin D. Okay, and there were some studies that show if you, you take too much, it actually can increase your risk of basal cells and squamous cells. Okay, I just mentioned this. Okay, you don't get your vitamin D from the sun. They did a study in Hawaii. All those people are exposed every day to the sun. They're in Maui. They're in Oahu. They're at Waikiki Beach. They're getting their sun daily. Most of those people tested are low vitamin D as well, okay? So you want to supplement and get it through foods, okay? You use the supplements based on your age. Children and elderly have different recommendations than your middle-aged people. I don't, I'm not a nutritionist. You could look up your normal daily allowance needed, and if you need extra because you don't get any UVB like me, I'm very low vitamin D. I take extra vitamin D. It is important, but again, do not get it and say it's from the sun. I'll argue with you if you tell me tan in bed, it will benefit your vitamin D, okay? It's not, the risks are too great, okay? Remember, sun protection, okay? It is, it does affect you. Again, it, it can cause death if you, with melanoma. And I hope this educated you, and I hope that um, some of you may have some questions that I can address. I hope I cleared up any um, controversies or helped you ed educate you on sunscreen and sun safety, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. That's okay. Um, you know, we use a lot of bleach and vinegar for infections and everything. It's okay. I would dilute it. I wouldn't do straight, you know, cap full in a gallon. And it, yes, I've heard of that. Okay? It, it can soothe. Correct? And I probably should have mentioned it. I, I gave you the, the American Academy of Derms guidelines. Like I said, you get on the internet and you start pulling up sunburn treatments, you will get all kinds of concoctions. And I just, I keep it simple. Okay? Keep it simple. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Okay, she's asking if you're in the water a lot and teach, she teaches aerob, water aerobics and um, for many hours, what can I do to protect my skin? Okay, that's the question. Again, frequent application of sunscreen. I would get a water, a extra water resistant kind because remember what I said, the extra water resistant, you get an 80 minute um, relief, okay? So you would need to do extra on that, okay? That would have more of a physical blocker to it, okay? They're thicker and they will say that on the bottle, okay? It'll say water resistant, extra water resistant. Um, you, you can find, you know, a lot of the sunscreens in any of your drugstores. Um, you can get online. There's a lot of companies. You know, I passed around a few. None of these, I think, are water resistant. Um, but you can find many of those, you know, either online or in local. Uh, there's many different kinds of even Walmart or CVS. Okay? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the UV rays. I do a lot of fishing. Mm -hmm. And I'm blonde, blonde hair. I like the blue eyes. A lot of surgery. Uh -huh. A lot of surgery. Okay. I had melanoma in my arm, and they saved my arm. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they, they've saved a lot of places on me. If you go fishing in salt water, and even though we're in your boat, even though you're on a canopy, I wind up getting burned. So. Again, um, you know, a, what. Probably a lot of what you did damage-wise was done young, as we all have. All of us in here are born before 90 didn't have good sunscreen. So, again, it's accumulation effect, okay? Uh, let me ask you one more thing. Yes. If I put sunscreen on, mm -hmm. and I do it a lot of perspiring, now when is the UV, UV rays the strongest? At 12 o'clock? 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is when you're... Pardon? 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is okay. when the rays are the strongest. Okay, you... You, um, I would recommend sun protective clothing for you okay. because that way, I mean, if you're constantly sweating, you're not going to be able to keep up. You're sweating off your um, sunscreen. So okay. If I, put, if, I, uh, if I perspire and I take a towel and, and get the sweat off of me, then I, I have to reapply. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I have just one little. Yes, ma'am. So sick. Uh, does that help at all against the sun? I'm sorry, repeat is the question. Is lipstick any help at all against the sun? The question is, is lipstick any help against the sun? Um, it's got to have sun protection in it. And there's a lot of chapsticks that do, you know, you may, you want to put a sun protective chapstick over top of it. I don't think it offers much unless it says it on the package. There are probably some formulations that they are adding a lot more of that into um, makeups, but I don't, know of one right now that actually has lipstick SPF protection. Could probably something that has a lot of grease in it. Well, make sure it, it's got to say that. And there are a lot of chapsticks that are sun protective for the lips. Yeah. Okay. Do they have UV in them? Yeah, they have protection. Oh, They'll yeah. say it on the bottle okay. or the, on the chapstick. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there anything you can recommend as far as getting a good pair of sunglasses? I mean, they say polarizing, I mean, the, and, and that's the best thing, but use them, okay? But polarizing is the recommendation that I'm aware. I'm not a, you know, an eye specialist. They can probably shed more light on that than I can. Unfortunately, you know, I tell people to wear them and protect, but I don't know all the specifics on specific sunglass and glass. Remember, and, and that is a good question because glass, window car glass does not protect you from UVB. So again, just a random glass on your, on your frames doesn't always protect you. Keep that in mind. So you do need something that does say sun protective, okay? Because not every glass does, okay? Is there a brand of sunscreen that you like better than another? Question is, is there a brand of sunscreen I like? I brought a bunch of different samples, okay? SPF 30, broad spectrum. I like facial for face because I break out if I have a greasy banana boat on my face, but to answer your question, everyone's different, okay? I mean, certain brands I like. For children, there's one called Blue Lizard. It has very few chemicals in it. In a baby that, you know, you don't want systemic absorption of a lot of chemicals in a baby, they're small. So Blue Lizard is a physical, more of a physical blocking sunscreen. It's thick, okay? 
very few chemicals so the babies don't get all that chemical absorption. Okay, so that a baby, when we have it for adults, there's blue lizard for sensitive skin. For those of you who may have eczemas or other skin ailments, that helps. You know, Neutrogena makes a lot of good ones. The sunscreen that's $30 a bottle, it's about $30 a bottle, that um, is recommended is the ingredient Mexoril, which I did not mention. It was available in Canada first, but that one's a really good one. La Roche-Posse makes it. I've seen it at CVS. I'm not sure they still sell it, but you can get it on the internet, but it's, the ingredient is Mexoril. That's a, one of the agents that really protects you from the sun. Some doctor's offices, I don't sell that. The only thing I sell is Blue Lizard because I am a pediatric dermatologist and um, I needed something for my kids and we don't sell it to make money. We sell it because there's nothing around that sells Blue Lizard. So we have bottles of it. But if any of you, go, you know, come to McIntosh Clinic, we do sell the Blue Lizard. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm just telling we have it available, but a lot of your plastic surgeon offices, some of your anestheticians may sell some of these agents. Um, Mexoril may be one of them. I think maybe Dr. Halston's office may have it. You can ask him. I know he carries some of those products too. But anything with broad spectrum, SPF of 30, I try not to promote too many brands. But, you know, again, Neutrogena, CeraVe, Clinique has, you know, a lot of their makeup lines, Estee Lauder. All of them have their sunscreen equivalents that are good. Mary Kay, they're all dermatology recommended. I, you know, everybody's complexion's different. And I, I mean, I break out to Neutrogena, so I don't use it, but somebody else loves it. So I can't, you know, everybody's different, as you well know. Some people are greasy, some people are dry. And you can't really, you know, just get those things that I mentioned in your sunscreen protection. Okay, hope that answers it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what about skin tags? What about skin tags? Yeah. The question is, what about skin tags? Skin tags are, have nothing to do with the sun. I just want to know. Skin tags are not cancerous, okay. and they're usually in what they call inertrogenous areas, or areas where skin rubs against skin. We think it's due to a lot of irritation. Um, you get them in pregnancy. Um, no bearing or anything on, on cancer or the okay. sun. All right, thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Are you saying that anything over 30? 30 and higher. Any, the question is sunscreen, anything over 30 and higher is recommended. Okay, so I, I thought you kept saying 30. I thought maybe you meant that you SPF of 30 or higher broad spectrum. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So if you go to 60. You're fine. You're getting more. Right. Remember what I said, 15, SPF of 15 is 94% protection. SPF of 30 is 97% protection. Anything over there is 1% or 2% more. So you're not, you're not doubling because you went from 30 to 60. That's my point. Correct. Yes, ma'am. You're saying that you don't get vitamin D from the sun. You do. The question is, do you get vitamin D from the sun? You get vitamin D in three ways. Supplements or vitamins, foods, and UVB exposure. And so what was going on was the tanning bed industry was promoting safe use of those because you get it's good for vitamin D. The reason I answer that, the fact that said my mother, she was in here, said I would always say you got to sit up in the sun and get vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Well, again, the risk of skin cancer with UVB, as I discussed, yeah. Well, she needs, supp she needs food and supplement. I mean, I tell people to get their vitamin D from supplements and diet. I'm not going to promote and tell you to go get a sunburn or tan to get your vitamin D. You see my point? Again, you get burned less than me. It's still, again, sun is damaging. Okay? That's my point on, with bringing that up. Yes, ma'am. about molds. I know the older I get, the more molds I get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question is, the older I get, I get more dark spots. Okay, not all your dark spots are moles. Okay, some of them are skin tags, like she mentioned. Some are what we call seborrheic keratosis, which I call them barnacles on the ship of life or experience spots. Anybody that's seen me, I'll probably say that 10 times, okay? You see those in running families, anybody age 30 and older can get those. They're kind of warty looking, they're brown, kind of papulated. They look like warts. A lot of people say, oh, I got warts all over me. 
There are barnacles on the ship of life, okay? Be thankful you're here to have them. That's what I say to patients. They're a nuisance. You can freeze them. They're not moles. They don't have cancerous potential. So not every dark spot has cancerous potential, okay? But my point is those that aren't educated in skin, and skin doesn't know that. They can look scary. They can look like a melanoma. I can show you some scary pictures of seborrheic keratosis, and you would think, oh, my God, I've got a melanoma, okay? Those alone can keep me in business, those seborrheic keratosis, as ugly as, and as many as a lot of people have. They're not cancer. They're not moles, okay? So that's probably, you're probably getting your experience spots, okay? And that beats the alternative. You got me? All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, if you got um, a mole that's flat and scaly, is it? So the question is if a mole is flat and then becomes scaly, okay, again, anything that changes, the A, B, C, D, E, the E, the evolving, scaly, bleeding, itching, but is it a mole, is it a melanoma, or is it a separate keratosis, is it a wart? So I can't, that's a hard question to answer because I would have to see it to see what it is. But that, that's why anybody over 50 and the peak age of skin cancer is 50 should be getting skin exams because you don't know that. You understand what I'm saying? So that's where you see skin cancer. You're blonde, fair, 50 is the age. Anything over that if, you know, should probably be checked by a physician. And a lot of primary care doctors are sufficient to do checks, and if they see something they're not sure of, they send to us, okay? So a lot of them, believe it or not, are monitoring your skin too, okay? I have many primary care doctors that refer, they've seen something on a patient and they don't like it, okay? And um, some of them know skin, some of them don't, but they are good at, they do a surveillance too, majority of them, and I get a ton of referrals from them saying, can you check and make sure this is okay? When we're not sure, we biopsy. Okay, you don't take chances on dark spots. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, uh, my lip was burning. Uh huh. And then it was really, the excruciation was burning. Like when I was laying down sleeping at night, it was burning. So I went to uh, to the uh, to the hair food store uh -huh. and they gave me some kind of. Uh, Chapstick. Uh -huh. it, 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 it didn't work. So finally, I went to a dermatologist. Okay. And uh, gave me some kind of uh, medication to put on my lips. Okay. And, and that helped me a lot. Okay. Because I thought uh, I it was a side effect from the medication I was taking. Mm hmm. All the medication, the medication I'm taking, but it, what it was, it was uh, the, he gave me this. Okay. Was it a sun, for? Did he think you had sun damage on your lips, or do you think it was more of an irritation on your lips? No, no. What happened was I had a stroke. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe it was coming mm -hmm. from that and coming from different medication. And it could be. It, it can. Be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that can cause lip irritation. But, you, but again, you can get sun damage on your lips as well, so that's the point I bring up, is keep in mind, protect your lips, okay? Because they can be a source of skin cancer as well. He gave me the medication. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a medication. That, uh, a cream. A cream, I forgot mm -hmm. the name of it. Mm -hmm. But it really helped me tremendously. Good, good. Any other questions? Well, I hope and appreciate your time and attention, and I hope you all have some safe beach trips now and you don't get sunburned. Thank you.